so we can get the program going. We've got a jam-packed two days, and I know people will be coming in as we start, but I'd like to get started. Um, I'm Dr. Sharon Levine, currently president of the Medical Board of California, and I'm delighted to be here today and to welcome you to our two-day forum dedicated to the growing problem of prescription drug abuse. And your presence here today and the speed with which people signed up for this program is a very strong signal to us that you share our belief and our concern about the issue of prescription drug abuse. This program is a, is a joint effort of the Medical Board and Pharmacy Boards of California. And our staff have been working on the event for about eight months. Our hope is that the forum will leave us with a much better understanding of the dimensions of the problem of prescription drug abuse and provide us tools for us to recognize and address the issues in our practices as prescribers and dispensers of these dangerous drugs. We've assembled an impressive faculty with very diverse professional backgrounds who will provide us with a variety of perspectives. They will clearly be speaking from their own experience and expertise, and we in fact may hear differences of opinion among the different speakers. We should, it should be a very interesting day and a half. Before we begin, I'd like to just go over some housekeeping details. Um, as, um, as you all know, please silence your cell phones, medical, uh, mobile devices, not medical devices, um, <laughs> <laughs> and put your phasers on stun so we aren't interrupted. Um, for those of you who are interested in CME credit, you need to sign in each day and complete the evaluation packet, um, it, the form in your packet. Um, in order to get credit, we need to have a, um, a, a verification that you've signed in, we need a filled out uh, evaluation form, and we need a clear email address to which we can send the credit, the CME form for credit. Um, and you have to be here all 10 hours to get 10 hours of credit. Uh, for those of you who are coming both days, please bring your badge tomorrow. Um, and as I said, we'll be emailing the certificates for those who are here for two days of CME within 30 days. And please print legibly. If we can't read your email address, we can't send the form. And if we can't read your name, uh, the email credit will go to, uh, the CME credit will go to someone else. Um, and for those of you who are, who are not here to get CME, we'd also appreciate getting your evaluations. Um, we, this is the first of these kinds of edu joint educational efforts, but our hope is it will not be the last. And so we are going to rely very heavily on your assessment of the educational value and the quality of this program as we think ahead to putting on programs in the future. It will be helpful to our staff if you can remain in the same seats after breaks and lunches in order to help us verify attendance for CME credit. There are breaks between the speakers as noted in the agenda you have in the packet. And if you need to leave outside of these breaks, please exit at the back doors. Um, it, it'll be helpful in terms of not disrupting the speakers. Restrooms are to the left and right of, in the lobby as you go out through the back doors. And due to the tight schedule, we, and we're not going to have the ability during the 15-minute breaks to have staff clean litter and stuff from the table. So please bus your own tables when, you're, um, when you leave. We're, we're planning to have time for question and answers after our speakers. If you have questions, please write them down today on the cards that are on the table. And we have two staff who will be circulating. Can you raise your hands? Kevin Shunky in the back, raise your hand, and Jamie Cordray, oh, Jamie Substitute, okay. Um, um, for those questions the speakers don't have time to answer, we will publish the speakers' answers on the Medical Board website within a couple weeks of the closure of the conference. We are recording this event, there's a camera over there recording, but it is not being webcast. And the video, for those of you who would like to refresh your understanding, will be posted on the website in about two weeks. I want to introduce now my counterpart from the Pharmacy Board, Dr. Amy Gutierrez, who's here also to welcome you and help shepherd the two days. Thank you, Dr. Levine. 
The pharmacy board is very proud to be working with the medical board on this very important issue. Both physicians and pharmacists and all of you are on the front line of prescription drug abuse, sometimes tied to the cause and sometimes tied to the solution. Our boards want to open up the lines of communication between physicians and pharmacists to help, prescription, help address prescription drug abuse. It's our hope that this event can contribute to the identification of greater solutions for our state. I wish to thank all of those who have agreed to participate. Speakers here are not being paid, so they're here because of their commitment to educate us. I also wish to thank all of you in attendance. We appreciate your acknowledgement of the critical nature of prescription drug abuse within our state and your commitment to learn. We have a very full afternoon, so without any delay, I will introduce California's Secretary of State and Consumer Services, Anna Caballero. Ms. Caballero serves Governor Brown as a cabinet member and as a Secretary of the State and Consumer Services Agency. Her responsibilities as secretary include the oversight of departments, including our medical and pharmacy boards, which are charged with civil rights enforcement, consumer protection, and licensure for 2.4 million working professionals. Ms. Caballero is a graduate of UC San Diego and UCLA Law School. She's a former member of the California State Assembly, mayor of Salinas, and city council member. Throughout her career of public service, she has showed her dedication to empower workers, working families, to build stronger and safe communities. While in the assembly, she received numerous awards in her work in youth violence, prevention, protection of local government, support for public school construction, water reliability, and sustainability. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Secretary of State and Consumer Services, Anna Caballero. Thank you very much, Dr. Gutierrez, and also thank you to Dr. Levine. I'm pleased to be here with you today, and I thank you for the invitation to join you. I bring you greetings from Governor Brown. First, I would like to commend the Medical Board and the Pharmacy Board for organizing this event, which brings together an incredible array of experts and resources to discuss what has become a national epidemic, prescription drug abuse. Prescription drugs are modern miracles. They can help people recover from serious disease, help people with serious ailments to live longer, help to improve the quality of people's lives, and help to alleviate pain. And I know you all know this. All of this with the assistance of licensed doctors and pharmacists. But things can go terribly wrong. Prescription drug abuse not only causes a great deal of individual and family misery, it impacts our communities, creating a tremendous loss in work productivity. It costs the states the state multiple millions of dollars in increased health care, mental health, and criminal justice services. That's why we have the California Medical Board and the California Pharmacy Boards, whose mission are to protect the consumer through the direct oversight and licensing of doctors and pharmacists. Two boards who have the capacity to impact policy discussions so that as our world changes, as the standards of care and drug utilization change, there is a forum for the sharing of information and a role that will allow for wise people to reach a consensus about what needs to be done to inform and protect the public and give, give guidance to medical professionals that write the prescription and dispense the drugs. That's why we are all here today, to inform and engage in a discussion about change. Again, I want to thank you to the, thank you to the boards and the board members who really do a great service um, to those of you who are doctors and pharmacists, um, they, they serve to protect the consumers and to hold, uphold the highest profession, uh, the professional abilities of the profession. So I want to thank them for their leadership on this issue. And now on to the business of the day. I am honored to be able to introduce the forum's keynote speaker, Michael Botticelli, Deputy Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Mr. Botticelli is President Obama's go-to person on drug control policy, and he oversees policy development on a variety of issues ranging from prescription drug abuse, driving under the influence of drugs, and community-based prevention programs, just to name a few. Prior to his appointment at the White House, 
Mr. Botticelli served as the director for the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. There, Mr. Botticelli helped guide and implement various evidence-based programs, such as treatment systems for adolescents, early interventions, and treatment programs in primary health care settings, jail diversion programs, and overdose prevention programs. He is also well known for his successful work in expanding nationally recognized prevention, intervention, treatments, and, rec and recovery services for the Commonwealth of Mach Massachusetts. Mr. Botticelli was recognized as the first recipient of the annual Ramstead Kennedy National Award for outstanding leadership in promoting addiction recovery. And in 2012, he was awarded the Service Award from the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. In addition, and possibly most importantly, he is also in long-term recovery and is celebrating more than 24 years of sobriety. We're delighted to have him here today to share his thoughts. Please join me in welcoming Deputy Director Michael Botticelli. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I want to thank the Secretary for that gracious uh, introduction, and also uh, to thank both Amy and Sharon for their organization. Uh, I was uh, sworn in to office uh, just about two months ago, um, and this is actually my first uh, out-of-state appearance, uh, so this is my debut performance uh, on behalf of the White House. Um, so, you know, but I can't think of a more fitting event, quite honestly, to come here and talk about prescription uh, drug abuse issues. Um, it is perhaps the biggest public health issue facing our country today, and certainly my time in Massachusetts really underscored on a you know, very uh, visceral level the impact that this has uh, within our community. So the, oops, let's see, great. So the Office of National Drug Control Policy uh, sets the president's um, overall federal drug control strategy um, uh, on both actually a domestic and international uh, level. And um, under the Obama administration a number of years ago in the inaugural plan in 2010, um, it really focused on a science-based, data-driven, public health approach to drug policy. So despite what you might hear in the media relative to the war on drugs and uh, drug warriors, this is really a public health approach to dealing uh, with the um, drug use issues um, in the United States. It's actually guided by three principles that addiction is a disease that can be both prevented and treated. I think many of you know, you know, historically this was viewed as a moral failing of folks and still we have some holdover of that or viewed solely as a criminal justice uh, issue, as a uh, crime issue. But this strategy really sets a more balanced public health approach, realizing that both public health and public safety have a vital role to play for us in reducing drug use and its consequences in the country. Um, that people with substance use disorders can recover. And, you know, part of, um, you know, as the Secretary said, I've been in re recovery for over 24 years. And, you know, I think I'm uh, emblematic of the millions of Americans who actually do recover from substance use. So, you know, I think we often hear all of the failures of folks, um, you know, lots of media hype relative to, you know, high profile celebrities who have, uh, quite honestly, a difficult time. Uh, maintaining and achieving sobriety, but you know, uh, I represent uh, millions of Americans throughout this country who uh, have successfully gotten treatment and go on to long-term recovery and return to productive lives. As well as criminal justice reform uh, can stop the revolving uh, um, uh, drug use and crime nexus. You know, clearly things like looking at uh, sentencing issues as well as uh, diverting people uh, into treatment who need treatment. Uh, in making sure that those who are incarcerated have good treatment behind the walls and that we have responsible reentry policies and practices for those who are coming back to our community. Um, this is a, a coordinated strategy, and you'll hear from one of our prime uh, partners uh, right after me from the Drug Enforcement Agency, but this is a coordinated effort uh, across federal government uh, with um, over 100 action items that we uh, have. Um, as the Secretary talked about, we have some signature initiatives as part of that plan. Certainly prescription drug abuse is what we'll, we'll talk about today. Uh, but prevention, and I think all of you as practitioners know, 
um, the value of, of prevention, of really making sure that we do a good job. And, and I think it's particularly true for people with substance use disorders. So, um, you know, I think uh, many of you know that only about one in 10 people who, who meet diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder get care and treatment for their disorder. One in 10. And that's abysmal, and we pay the consequences both in terms of mortality, in terms of health care costs, and in terms of crime. And it's not a failure of people with the disease, right? So even some of our historic language that we often said people with addiction had to hit bottom before we were ready to give them help, right? And so think of any other disease where we say you have to self-diagnose your own disorder before we're ready to treat you. Clearly, m motivation plays a role, but motivation plays a role in many chronic diseases and many behavioral issues. You know, all, all we have to do is point to our success around tobacco to know that we as a healthcare system um, and as communities um, have a vital role to play in terms of looking at both uh, preventing um, and doing a better job at early intervention and treatment. And certainly drug driving uh, is um, an issue for our office. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the prescription drug abuse problem. Uh, in America, 6.1 million Americans reported current non-medical use of prescription drugs, current being defined as past month use. This is largely uh, uh, data from the nationally administered National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, one in five people who use drugs for the first time, so new drug initiate, initiates in 2010, began by using a prescription drug non-medically. One in, one in five people who tried a drug for the first time. And why is that? Well, one of the things we know in terms of, of, of why people uh, uh, choose to do something or use particularly a substance, um, there are, you know, among many, there are two uh, risk factors. And one is per perception of risk. So if you perceive something as risky, you're less likely to do it. And availability. And if something's available, you know, you're more likely to do it. And so clearly we know that um, there is this perception that prescription drugs, and particularly prescription ma pain medication, because they're legal, because they're prescribed by a doctor, um, are seen as safer. And clearly, you know, availability plays a role in terms of people choosing to use drugs non-medically. Um, you know, so, so, so the dire consequence, and I actually have trouble talking about these statistics because I, they're, they're mind-boggling to me. Um, of the 38,000 plus drug overdoses in 2010, 22,000 involved prescription drugs. Over 16,000, 16,600 involved opiate painkillers, and that's more than heroin uh, and cocaine combined. And when you think about that, I ran the numbers this morning, that's 45 people a day in this country who are dying as a result of, of opioid painkillers. 45 people a day. And I sound like a terrible public health person when I say this, but you know, when we talk about influenza and our response to influenza, you know, the magnitude of what we're talking about here relative to the impact of, of prescription drug abuse is just uh, staggering to me. You know, as the secretary talked about, you know, both in terms of substance use in general, but particularly with prescription drug use, um, you know, we have a significant cost driver to our healthcare system and also our criminal justice system. Um, and that studies have found that opioid uh, abusers generate on average annual direct costs 8.7 times higher than non-abusers. And, and again, this is, you know, this is, these are statistics that also bear out for substance use in general. So, so what have we seen? So the um, Centers for Disease Control uh, classify and look at injury deaths. Right. So here's trends over time from 1980 to 2010. And you'll see the dramatic increase in uh, uh, drug poisonings are obviously classified as poisonings. You know, and you'll see the dramatic increase in drug poisonings. Um, and quite honestly, the decrease in motor vehicle fatalities. And so about 2008, we saw for the first time in this country that drug overdose deaths, drug poisoning deaths, exceeded motor vehicle fatalities as the single largest cause of injury death in the United States. That's huge. Um, and here is uh, state overdose uh, death rates. Um, it's about 12.3 uh, per, uh, per 100,000. So you'll see how California uh, uh, pairs up a little bit less than the national average. But just a, a word of caution, what we found in Massachusetts, one of the things that we did was that was particularly helpful is we actually geocoded um, our overdose deaths um, by uh, municipality. And what we found, quite honestly, were there were surprising areas of, of mortality that um, uh, 
didn't come to our attention before, and I, I think we have a tendency to think that uh, drug overdose deaths are confined to a lot of our urban centers, and when you geocode the data, it's really interesting to see where you find, uh, where you find uh, unexpected pockets of, of overdose deaths. Um, here is um, the, the same information by, uh, uh, by drug mention, um, and you'll see uh, opioids just um, uh, skyrocketing from 1999 to 2010. These are not mutually exclusive, and I think one of the things that we see, um, quite honestly, is um, you have benzodiazepines, and one of the things that we know uh, is uh, that uh, drug overdose deaths also, um, with opiates, usually involve um, either alcohol or benzodiazepines. Um, so it's one of the issues that we have to continue to pay attention to. Um, here's a slide that I think um, is also telling when uh, we look at rates of um, opiate, uh, opioid overdose deaths, sales, and treatment. And you'll see the trend lines going up dramatically uh, th through 2010. You know, I will also say part of the, you know, you'll see the 2010 information is, is the latest information that we have. And it's really challenging from a public health perspective, quite honestly, to be re reacting um, in any sort of uh, quick way to, um, to um, you know, over two-year-old data. Um, so, you know, part of our challenge, both at the federal and at the state and local level, is how do we get a better and more timely, uh, more timely data relative to what's happening in a given community or in a given state. Um, when you look at, I think this is a very interesting slide, because I think part of what this does is begin to chart a course for us in terms of how, how, what should our response be, both federally at a state and a community level relative to, um, to uh, uh, prescription pain relievers. And so again, this is information from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and it shows where people got, what was the source of, of non-medically used uh, prescription pain relievers. And the, the first bar is recent initiates. So it's just looking at if you used a drug for the first time. And it shows that about 70% of those folks got them, obtained them free from a friend or relative, uh, uh, with or without asking. Um, and then the, the um, kind of burnt orange is prescribed from one or more doctors. And the smaller green portion is bought from a friend or relative, a dealer, or an internet. And, you know, as I always, you know, kind of used to continue to say is that, you know, in some respects, this is an epidemic of the medicine cabinet. And I think, you know, that as Americans and as consumers, we're, we're, we're kind of trained to be prescription hoarders, right? So we get a prescription, you know, we say, okay, we're only, you know, you may get a 30-day supply, you know, you use five, and you stick you know, you stick the rest in the medicine cabinet. And, you know, there's lots of anecdotal reports about, you know, particularly young adults visiting their grandparents uh, more often than they used to, of going to open houses, uh, you know, uh, when they really don't have the money to buy. You know, so, so part of this is really looking at, quite honestly, and you'll see later, is, how, you know, how do we get that supply um, and diminish the opportunity for, uh, for folks who got a medication through a legitimate legal prescription um, uh, out of the supply and minimize the chance that they got, get diverted. Um, also, in the, one of the things that the survey did that's not illustrated here is for, for that 70% of people um, who got them uh, free from a friend or relative, they asked them, um, where did that person get the medication? And, and again, about 70% of people in this uh, blue bar um, said that person got it from just one physician. So clearly while we have an issue around doctor shopping uh, and uh, uh, internet sales and illegal sales, you know, we're talking uh, uh, to a large degree about d drugs where people got it from a physician for a legitimate prescription um, and it got diverted from there. And then you'll see how those percentages change over time when you look at frequent use and, and more chronic use. And, and again, I think this is typical of people who um, go on to develop a, an addictive dis disorder that they look at um, uh, more illegal ways uh, to get um, medication. So in, um, in 2010, um, the federal government, and I, you know, I, um, I, I remember being at the state level um, in 2010, and you know, really, um, f from my perspective, 
um, it was um, incredibly helpful, incredibly timely to have a coordinated federal response. This was an issue, um, you know, I think most folks on the West Coast were still dealing and continue to deal with a crystal meth epidemic. Those of us who were in the Northeast who had historically high rates of heroin, I think saw the prescription uh, uh, drug abuse issue faster uh, uh, than the rest of the country. You know, so it was really important for us to have, you know, a, both a coordinated federal, state, and local response to this. So this is a, a, a plan that was uh, uh, published, uh, developed in 2010, published in 2011. It's really a coordinated effort across uh, federal government entities, and you'll hear some of our work, particularly with our, you know, our partners at the DEA, and really has four uh, focus areas. Um, one is education, and we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more about each of these uh, different areas, about the implementation and utilization of prescription drug monitoring programs, around proper medication disposal, and also about enforcement. Um, and so one of the things that as we talk about with education, um, the GAO did a study um, and published in 2011 and, and no surprise, um, you know, found that there was a serious gap among prescribers, those in the medical community, about the importance of appropriate prescribing and in general how to recognize substance use in their patients and on treating pain. And so I, I have permission to tell this story. So, and I've told it before, and this is, the dental board's not here, so I can, I can talk about dentists. Um, so, so I, had, I had this fabulous dentist in Boston for years and years and years. And, you know, on the intake form, it has, you know, history of, history of addiction, and I checked it off, and we talked about it, and he knew I was the state guy for substance use services in Massachusetts, and he knew I was in recovery. And after a dental procedure, he says to me without hesitation, would you like a prescription for Percocet? And I said, Doc, I am not the guy you should be prescribing Percocets to. And, and, and again, I know it's anecdotal, but I think it shows, and again, this is not a blame perspective. I think, it, you know, if you think back on your residency or, or your training, you know, how much training did you get around addiction? Or, um, you don't. You know, historically, substance use, you know, diseases of the brain have been treated over here, and diseases of the body have been treated over here. And I always say, if you take out your insurance card, Chances are you have your primary care physician number on one side, but if you have a behavioral health issue, call this other number over here. Um, and you know, so and it's time I think that we look at how do we make sure that we get good holistic care, and how we make sure that we that we understand that diseases of the brain um, have a direct impact on diseases of the body. So it's it's really important for us to 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 look at um, uh, understanding that behavioral health care is health care in general. Uh, for pharmacists, you know, again, I think the, the data shows that um, uh, only about 68% receive two hours or less of addiction uh, or substance use education in pharmacy school, and about 30% reported no addiction training at all. But when they did, they were more inclined to, to understand the disease of addiction and to give uh, good counseling and more frequent counseling and felt comfortable counseling. So what are our educational goals of, as it relates to the plan? Obviously, knowledge on appropriate prescribing, and that's why you're all here today. Um, effective identification of patients at risk for substance use disorders, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go on. Um, screening, identification, and referral for those misusing or abusing prescription drugs. You know, part of the reason why only one in 10 people um, uh, get treatment is, you know, we don't have systematic screening and identification protocols, largely within primary care settings. And so a lot of the work um, that's happening both nationally and at the state level is, is looking at uh, using validated screening tools. So, if, you know, if you think of substance use as a, as a pyramid, you know, the vast majority of people either don't use substances or don't use them uh, uh, with any, uh, uh, any ill consequences. You know, then you have the top of the pyramid, which is about one in 10 who meet diagnostic criteria. But then the bigger portion, about 25%, misuse alcohol and or other drugs with some level of consequence to them. And it's usually those people that get missed, right? So because we don't necessarily do kind of routine screening or routine intervention with um, school counselors, with pediatricians, with primary care physicians. And, and again, you know, I use myself as an example of this. So, you know, I am your classic at-risk person. Family history of substance use started, you know, drinking at an early age. You know, that progressed, you know, through college and graduate school and beyond. But 
but there were never systematic interventions in place to, to basically divert me um, from developing a more significant problem. And one of the things that we found um, when you do this uh, uh, systematic screening and brief intervention that you can actually reduce um, both alcohol and drug use and keep people from progressing to more significant addictive disorders. So it's really an opportunity here for us to think about that. Um, clearly, prescription drug monitoring uh, use in everyday clinical practice is a big goal of ours. And ensuring community leaders, parents, and young people understand the dangers of prescription uh, drug misuse. Um, you know, I, I, I've talked to kind of countless parents um, over my time uh, in this field, you know, and, and, you know, they often talk about substance use uh, or addiction as a disease of denial. Well, that denial doesn't necessarily just lie with the person who uses substance, but usually uh, involves, you know, a complete family system. And so part of our part of our work is not only to understand the specific dangers around prescription pain medication, but also to understand some of the risk around substance use in general. So some of the main actions that we're looking at is legislation requiring mandatory education for all clinicians who prescribe controlled substances, uh, increased substance use education in health professions, schools, residency programs, and continuing education protocols, expedited research on the development of abuse deterrent formulations. Um, I think uh, some of you might have seen that the FDA just recently put out guidance to the field uh, and to uh, the industry relative to criteria around what constitutes abuse determined formulations, and expansion of overdose prevention tools, including the use of naloxone, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about that as we go on. Um, as it relates to monitoring, uh, uh, the, the implementation, the development and implementation um, of uh, prescription drug monitoring programs in every state and interoperability among states. It's clearly a goal um, to make sure that, uh, you know, so one of, one of the things that I think has been interesting is that uh, in Florida, for example, that didn't have a prescription drug monitoring program had very uh, uh, loose regulations relative to uh, uh, dispensing and prescribing. As they clamp down, we, you know, one of the things that we've seen um, is folks moving to Georgia, which has a less stringent prescription drug monitoring program. So, you know, clearly looking at some level of, uh, of unified standards as well as interoperability uh, among states is uh, uh, really important. You know, the other piece too that we've been working on, um, and that's at the bottom, is we've been working with the uh, off of ONC, there's more acronyms at the federal level than I, I can, uh, with the Office of National Coordinator who is responsible for looking at the development of, of health information technology systems. We've been working with a number of states and a number of providers looking at how do we enhance the utility of the system. And one of the things that we heard in Massachusetts, I'm not sure you know, how it works here, is that physician said, you know, I don't have time, quite honestly, to kind of log out of a health, electronic health record, log into another system of care and to be able to do that. And so one of the things that we're looking at is how do we enhance the utilization and the ease with which you can access that information. And um, uh, what we hope to be able to do um, is have the results of those pilots available fairly soon um, as, um, as well as uh, to hope uh, state systems ad adopt some of the pilots that have been hugely successful. Um, uh, so the use of systems by prescribers to identify patients who are potentially at risk or engaged for prescription drug use, that's a lot of screening and brief intervention. Um, we've also been working with the Department of Veterans Affairs to share prescription drug data with uh, state uh, prescription drug monitoring programs. And currently 14 states can share data across state lines. So, you know, the, the, the um, National Association of, I believe, Pharmacy Boards has also been working in terms of, of helping programs do that. So there you'll see a lay of the land nationally uh, prescription monitoring programs, uh, and you'll see that big yellow spot in the middle of the country where we, uh, we have pending legislation uh, uh, relative to Missouri. Um, so we're hoping that that uh, happens quickly as well as the blue where it's been enacted, but the program is yet uh, operational. So uh, enforcement, and, and uh, you'll hear more about this uh, um, from the DEA, um, is to increase law enforcement and prosecutor training around prescription drug uh, diversion and abuse, to assi assist states in addressing pill mills and doctor shopping. Uh, those actions consist of providing technical assistance to states on model regulations and laws for pain clinics. Um, the, the Office of National Drug Control Policy uh, funds um, in just about every region of the country what we call high intensity drug trafficking areas um, and encourage them to focus on uh, prescription drug diversion cases. 
and support prescription drug abuse related training for law enforcement agencies and criminal justice leaders. And again, you'll see that you know this is, I think, emblematic that this needs to be both a public health and, and public safety approach in terms of how we deal with both availability and treatment. Um, so one of the emerging issues that we were just talking about offline, um, that while we've seen some promising uh, data relative to the decrease um, in prescription drug use nationally, one of the issues that we've been concerned about, um, and there was an article that was just uh, published in the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment, I believe, that showed a dramatic increase of heroin use among 18 to 25 year olds who were admitted to treatment. And what they found was that a significant predictor was non-medical use of prescription pain medication. And this is really disturbing. This is really disturbing. I mean, if the other stuff wasn't disturbing, you know, this is particularly disturbing in terms of looking at, one, our treatment capacity, but also the consequence, not just of overdose, but of viral hepatitis and, uh, and HIV, particularly with this, uh, with this young population. Here. So I think we really have to um, pay attention to this, and this is why access to treatment becomes so, so critical that, you know, as we do a better job of appropriate prescribing, of, of diminishing diversion, that unless folks who have an addictive disorder get into treatment, you know, um, they'll just move on to other substance. And one of the issues that we've seen as well is, you know, some uh, level of trafficking of heroin to, to areas, parts of the country that have significant prescription drug use issue. And one of the things that we used to hear in Massachusetts all the time is that it becomes a si simple economic issue. Right? So, you know, generally Oxy Oxycontin is about a what? A buck a milligram on the street, you know. But, but heroin, at least in New England, was very, very cheap. It was about $5 a bag. So, you know, unless you resorted to criminal activity to get money for Oxycontin, that there was a quick progression uh, to heroin uh, for, for, because tolerance was increasing, but also um, from an economic standpoint, it was just cheaper to use heroin. Um, so, so it's an issue that I think we have to pay attention to nationally, and it's an issue that I think we have to pay attention to at both the state and the local level. So, so the other issue that we have been working on um, is really looking at widespread overdose prevention and education. Um, and the National Drug Control Strategy supports overdose training and emergency interventions, particularly the use of naloxone uh, by first responders. So one of, there's been extensive uh, uh, research, well, I, mean, I shouldn't say extensive, there's been research that shows that um, uh, you know, administration of naloxone, particularly by first responders, can be r done in a safe way, and, but also have a dramatic impact in terms of uh, and reduction and reversal of overdoses. Um, clearly more extensive public education campaigns about overdose, including the signs and symptoms of overdose. For people, you know, overdose, y you know, you know this, it doesn't, you know, it's, it, it happens from minutes to hours. That people who overdose generally don't overdose alone. Um, that there is a tremendous amount of fear of calling 911 in the event of an overdose for fear of, of criminal repercussions. So, you know, here we have, um, you know, a, clearly an opportunity for an intervention with a very safe, non-toxic substance um, that could seem, that's administered safely by uh, folks who, um, particularly first responders who are often on the scene. Um, you know, so many states are looking at and are passing Good Samaritan laws, which provide limited immunity from prosecution when you're reporting and calling 911. Um, and, and again, the importance of connecting people to substance use treatment. You know, we need to make sure that treatment is readily available. Often, you know, an overdose um, is a, a life-changing event and an, op an intervention opportunity um, to get people into treatment. Um, uh, so, you know, we have been doing um, uh, work uh, relative to looking at um, uh, uh, first responders' uses of naloxone. Um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is in the process of developing an opiate overdose toolkit uh, that will be released uh, hopefully soon um, to get more information out about uh, both um, uh, um, naloxone and, quite honestly, wider 
physician prescribing of naloxone uh, for patients who are high risk are also an opportunity. Um, again, you know, there's been building research relative, relative to its efficacy. Um, and a recent study, uh, um, actually the author is uh, here in San Francisco, um, uh, looked at uh, the cost effectiveness. So, you know, clearly there's a cost effectiveness to uh, naloxone distribution. And a report uh, done from my home state of Massachusetts that I feel very proud about uh, in the British Medical Journal that just showed uh, finally and conclusively that when you uh, implement a, a naloxone distribution program, particularly in areas of high prevalence, um, that it does in fact reduce mortality. We always knew that naloxone was very good at reducing overdose, uh, reversing overdoses, but we didn't know the extent to which that it really reduced mortality. And, and what, that, um, what that study showed was that uh, there was a dosage effect, that the more, um, you know, clearly the more you spread naloxone within a community, uh, the greater the reduction in mortality. Um, we were the first uh, state to actually train a police department, and I believe they're still the first police, they're the only police department in the country that has been trained to um, administer uh, um, uh, naloxone. And, and quite honestly, that came from parents of kids who were overdosing. And they were basically saying, you know, you need to have it. Um, and so uh, uh, local law enforcement um, uh, uh, became part of our pilot that we developed in Massachusetts. Um, and since 2010, they have uh, reversed over 100 uh, overdoses in the small town of Quincy, Massachusetts, which is really amazing. And the, the other piece, quite honestly, that you'll hear Chief Glynn talk about is that it's dramatically changed the relationship between law enforcement and the community, and that law enforcement is not necessarily, is not seen as um, an inhibitor, it's not seen as an impediment, that they're seen as partners in terms of dealing with a significant community issue. And so, you know, it's really been astounding uh, in terms of both, you know, the impact it's had in terms of re uh, reversing overdoses, but, but also in terms of changing the relationship between local law enforcement um, and the community. Um, in a recent uh, editorial in the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, our partners at NIDA and the FDA are clearly interested in, in working with pharmaceutical partners and companies uh, b uh, looking at the efficacy of, of naloxone. Um, you know, they've clearly signaled um, that they want to continue to, to look at um, uh, um, uh, more widespread naloxone uh, distribution, uh, and particularly uh, nasal Narcan. So nasal Narcan is currently off-label. It's an off-label use, um, but they clearly signal their intent to continue to focus on these uh, areas. So, so what are the opportunities for state leadership here? Um, clearly, yeah, there have been uh, developed and implemented uh, uh, screening brief intervention billing codes that can be used uh, for a wide variety of interventions and, con and consultation with patients from overdose prevention, uh, substance use in general, uh, looking at neonatal abstinence syndrome, but it can be used for a wide variety of interventions. Um, those codes uh, obviously need to be turned on. Um, so we've been working uh, with state Medicaid offices primarily to look at uh, uh, turning on your ability to build those codes as well as private insurance um, to do that. Um, medications exist for treatment for addiction, and particularly for uh, opiate addiction. Um, these are some, quite honestly, of the most scientifically evaluated medications that we have, and they continue to be some of the most um, misunderstood medications uh, that we have, uh, but we have very, very effective uh, medications, particularly for the treatment of opiate addiction. Um, you know, we saw under the Drug Abuse and Treatment Act um, the approval of buprenorphine uh, suboxone uh, for use in primary care settings. And, you know, that has dramatically changed the landscape from our perspective. So if you no longer have to tell, you know, if you no longer have to tell your employer that you're going to detox, if you can go to a primary care setting and be indistinguishable from someone who's getting addiction treatment and someone who's getting primary care, it dramatically reduces the stigma we know associated with people's reluctance to get treatment. Um, you know, methadone, you know, has been around for over 50 years. You know, it's probably the most evaluated medication that we have, but uh, I still have stab wounds in the back of trying to cite methadone programs in Massachusetts. I don't know what it's like here in California, but it's the most misunderstood medication that we have, um, and it's one of the most effective. 
And then we recently saw the approval of Vivitrol for opiate addiction. So again, administered in primary care. So we have a medication here that we know is effective, quite honestly underutilized. So you know, if anybody wants to get their DEA number, sign up for training. Um, we want to look at uh, examining potential partnerships to expand overdose prevention efforts uh, through first responders and look at how do we make sure that family members, drug users, uh, our correction staff, our treatment providers um, are doing a good job at educating people who are at risk. Part of what we know is a uh, risk factor is you know when you've not used for a while, your tolerance dramatically decreases. So if you've been in treatment for a while, if you've been incarcerated for a while, if you haven't used, you're at heightened risk. And so how do we make sure that folks who are coming out of treatment, who are coming out of our correctional facilities, um, have good education, and quite honestly, are getting linked back up with treatment. Um, we want to make sure that formularies uh, should consider abuse-determined formulations and safety profiles of medications. So, you know, again, working with uh, CMS um, uh, and insurers to make sure that they're looking at their formularies. Um, and take steps for barriers for women to obtain prenatal care and substance use treatment. You know, uh, if the stigma is not bad enough, particularly for pregnant women, you know, fear of being reported to um, child welfare for abuse and neglect has a significantly chilling effect for pregnant women in terms of entering treatment. So how do we make sure that, you know, we minimize those barriers and also that we have good treatment programs uh, for pregnant women? We have, you know, one of the issues that we had in Massachusetts was a significant uh, 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 reluctance, quite honestly, liability driven in terms of admitting women, uh, pregnant women to treatment. So how do we make sure we have good uh, treatment programs to do that? So um, just in, in wrapping up, you know, there are, as I said, there are signs and efforts that are, um, that our efforts to reduce pre prescription drug abuse are working based on national survey data um, that it's decreased from 7 million in 2010 to 6.1 million in 2011. Again, the, the caveat here is, you know, we want to uh, make sure that um, those folks who need it are going into treatment so that we're minimizing the progression uh, to heroin. Um, that young adults ages 18 to 25 currently using prescription drugs declined 14 percent. So that's, you know, we think we're going in the uh, um, uh, right direction. And again, long-term success will come from coordination and collaboration at the federal, state, local, and tribal levels, and quite honestly, within all segments of, of, of those uh, partners. So uh, law enforcement, medical community, treatment community, health and human services community. So. Um, uh, I'll end there. There's more information. Our, our complete plan uh, is on our website, um, and uh, I think we have some time for questions and answers. So um, there's people here with cards over here. Uh, I'm under the impression that a large number, a large percentage of inmates in the California uh, uh, community care uh, due to substance use related crimes. Only two of the many CDCR must be state facilities offer substance use treatment or diversion. Uh, they are a captive audience. I, I couldn't ag agree more and I think, you know, part uh, again, I think of both, um, both uh, federal and state is, is how do we make sure that there are some people um, who need to be incarcerated, but uh, you know, how, again, how do we divert people um, who don't need to be incarcerated to make sure that they get treatment? For those who are behind the walls, how do we make sure that they're getting good evidence-based uh, treatment? And I would uh, absolutely, you know, agree that you know there are many people within our correctional facilities with significant addiction issues, and we should uh, make sure that uh, they get treatment. Um, what measures are the federal government considering in capping pharma production and marketing? Oxycontin comes to mind. What, uh, why are patents granted to products that have been available for 
many decades. Pain management residents need more uh, object monitoring. Um, you know, one one of the things that you know, again, we've been working um, and the, working very very closely with the FDA, uh, and they actually just recently had a hearing last week to to look at and to get uh, feedback relative to the prescribing of, of pain medications as well as labeling. So, you know, I think the FDA, um, and again, you know, the FDA put, just recently put out guidance uh, looking at the criteria for abuse de uh, deterrent formulation. You know, so, so clearly the FDA um, has been involved in these issues. I think they are trying uh, uh, um, in a very responsible and prudent way to, to be looking at these issues. And they have been uh, a significant partner with us on the federal level relative to this issue. Uh, you didn't speak about the role pharma has played contributing to the problem. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I should punt that to my DEA partner, Joe. Um, no, I, I mean, clearly there's been, you know, there's been um, uh, criminal cases um, uh, regarding the marketing of, of, of pharmaceuticals and, you know, and even some significant comment by former FDA administrators in terms of not really understanding the risks associated um, with this and and quite honestly around industry practices uh, relative so I think you know the you know there's 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 law as it relates to kind of the role that industry has played uh, relative to um, the the marketing of these uh, medications as well as um, significantly you know particularly as they pertain to um, uh, underestimating the uh, significant risk of addiction that's associated with uh, these pain medications. Um, it seems unlikely that we would need to administer naloxone in the office clinic setting. Do you know whether in California there might be good Samaritan liability protections as a physician giving naloxone in the non-clinic emergent setting? You know, I don't know what the specific laws are that pertain here to Massachusetts, or that pertain to California. Um, I know that some municipalities are doing that. I know that there's legislation proposed in New Jersey just introduced uh, legislation that would, um, and I know that we were looking at in Massachusetts, that would give um, liability to protection to prescribers to prescribe naloxone for other than someone who is in front of them. Right, so if you had a mom come into your office who said, you know, my son has significant history of overdoses, to provide liability protection uh, to that physician to give naloxone to the mom. Um, and again, you know, I, there, there's also, uh, seems to be, and again, you know, you probably have to talk to your own legal counsel, um, but, you know, really encouraging physicians to prescribe naloxone uh, to particularly high-risk patients who are also getting opioids at the same time. So there's, you know, I think ample opportunity to, to do that. And again, you know, looking at also other opportunities um, into, uh, uh, to look at more widespread uh, distribution and availability of naloxone appears uh, to, to be prudent as well, particularly among first responders. Do more liberal count, uh, countries like the Netherlands have the same prescription abuse problem? Should we liberalize marijuana laws and push for heroin clinics like some European countries. Um, you know, I'm not sure, I, you know, and I'll say I'm not trying to evade this question. Um, you know, I haven't seen kind of national, uh, internationally from Netherlands around prescription, uh, pres particularly the prescription uh, drug use issue here. And, and again, I think, you know, what we have trying to kind of say is that this is not, a, you know, this is a, not a, you know, an issue about um, completely abandoning some of our legal parameters around drugs. Um, or in the opposite direction, looking at this I know, as a war on uh, you know, as, as a war on drugs. I think what, what our office has really tried to do is take a much more balanced scientific and public health and public safety approach to how we deal with this. You know, one of the things that I, I think has been clear um, and, and of a concern to us, particularly as it relates to marijuana, so um, is that, you know, what's the public health impact um, and particularly what's the impact on our youth rel relative to uh, um, uh, legalization of marijuana. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's um, chilling to me sometimes when I hear some of the public rhetoric around uh, marijuana that it is safe, it's non-addictive, 
Um, uh, there was just, if you, if you look at adolescent treatment emissions nationally, the vast majority of them are there for um, alcohol or marijuana use. Um, there was, um, uh, I'll get the site, but there was a study that just looked at um, adolescent treatment emissions and found out that, and they asked the adolescents where they got uh, the marijuana from, and the vast majority of it got it uh, diverted from dispensaries, medical marijuana dispensaries. So, so I think it's important, um, you know, that we understand and look at um, what, what is a significant public health impact that we have in terms of, of legalization. Um, that's right. Uh, why were the methadone diversion programs canceled? I'm not uh, sure if someone who wrote that wants to elaborate. I'm not sure I fully understand the, the question. Um, the, the, this is an interesting question, the story detail. Are you saying that alcoholics should not be given narcotics? Uh, absolutely not. Um, absolutely not. I think, you know, again, in, in my scenario, uh, and, and I think in prudent prescribing, you know, what, what would have been helpful with my dentist in this case is if we had a discussion about what my pain plan was prior to any procedure. So let's not wait till after the fact to do that, but particularly people with history, sometimes people do it. And that's where I think, you know, kind of looking at dosage, looking at monitoring, uh, at understanding what some of the signs and symptoms of, you know, so if all of a sudden I have a 15 day supply and at day seven I'm calling my doc and saying, hey doc, you know, my prescription ran out because I was really in bad pain, that might be a signal to someone that, you know, they might want to think about uh, getting me off the pain medication. So this is, this is not about not prescribing or giving appropriate pain prescribing, particularly with people with histories of, 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 of addiction, but, but how do we do that in concert with the patient? How do we do that and make sure that we're monitoring it to make sure that they're used appropriately? Um, so, so it's not, it's not a, a case of, of quite honestly, uh, you know, people suffering, but, but how do we do it in a really prudent, responsible way and monitor it as we go along? Um, why do prescribing opiates for chronic pain and the implications take so long to be addressed? Um, you know, I, I, despite the fact that I often like to play physician, um, I, I'm actually going to defer this question. I think there's some other folks who are here throughout today and tomorrow who, who might be more appropriate to, to answer that question. Um, on death, suicide or accidental? This is a really interesting question. Uh, we were actually just looking at data. So, so by far, most of the overdose deaths are unintentional. Um, and I'm trying to remember the number off the top of my head, Patrick. Do you remember? I know we just had this presentation yesterday. Um, but, but clearly, you know, one of the things that we've been seeing, so we know, quite honestly, there's a nexus between suicide and drug use. We've known that for a long time. But we're also looking at drug overdose deaths, and there's been some uptick uh, relative to opiates and, and suicides. And um, so uh, uh, we, uh, we're actually having a meeting with the um, Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention to fully explore this. Um, but by and large, most of the uh, uh, drug overdose deaths are unintentional. Um, but, but there has been some concern uh, relative to, um, uh, um, are, you know, are we seeing an increase um, in, in suicide for people with histories of drug use? Uh, Drug-related crimes, communities under, uh, committed under the influence or in process of obtaining drugs illegally. Uh, drug-related crimes committed under the influence or in the process of obtaining drugs illegally. I'm sorry, sorry I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not sure I fully um, understand that one. War on drugs going on for decades is, uh, is successful. It should be over by now. Otherwise, what alternatives uh, do we have? And, you know, again, I, you know, I, 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 I would say that, you know, part, part of what we know, um, uh, is, is based on our scientific understanding of, of what's effective, both in terms of the public safety um, and the public health side. And, and you know, um, you know we've, we, we've had kind of a, a long history in this country of, of, of uh, policy based on um, uh, uh, incarceration and crime. And, and I think that this administration has really been trying to change that around. Um, you, know, we didn't, you know, we didn't win the battle with tobacco, um, 
in a couple years. You know, and we're not going to, and you know, clearly there's evidence that these strategies are working. You know, quite honestly, with the exception of marijuana, um, that use, drug use in this country continues to go down. Um, and we see that across the board, with the exception of marijuana. With the exception, marijuana use continues to be at historically high levels. And interestingly enough, perception of risk is at its lowest level that it's ever been. So, you know, I think our efforts are paying off in terms of having this balanced approach uh, to, to drug policy in the country. Um, is the pendulum swinging from under treatment of pain to over prescription? Um, again, I, it, I'm probably not the best person to um, answer that, but I think, you know, if you look at some of the data, you know, uh, and again, this is coming from someone who doesn't, you know, you, you know, clearly the focus of our office does, you know, is not about under treatment of pain. You know, it's not. It's really about, you know, looking at kind of responsible prescribing, and I think that's the whole point of this forum today, that, that, you know, we, you know, have and set the pendulum somewhere in the middle to make sure that we are doing appropriate pain prescribing, but we're not over prescribing and we're not prescribing to people who shouldn't be getting opiates or that we're appropriately monitoring, um, you know, what happens when we're giving, uh, uh, you know, very, very strong um, uh, medications to folks. So I think the goal of today, and quite honestly the goal of the plan, is to really set that pendulum in the middle so that we don't have this wild vacillation between, you know, under treatment of pain and over prescribing of pain medications. So I think that's really the, the whole focus today. Um, one issue that may contribute to drug abuse is the inability of the public to dispose of um, unneeded prescription drugs. Uh, state law prohibits. What do the boards recommend on state level to allow for proper disposal of controlled substances? Thank you. Uh, this um, uh, sounds like a plant question, but it's uh, not. So, so one of the things I think that, you know, in partnership with the DEA, the DEA has actually been uh, supporting um, across the country take back days um, that are happening. I know that we partner with many of our drug free communities and many of our community coalitions to help support that work. I believe there's another one coming up, if I'm not mistaken, April 27th, um, 29th, uh, uh, um, so April 9th. Uh, the other uh, peak, uh, I'm sorry. April 27th. Um, the, the other thing that uh, uh, there have been proposed uh, regulations released by the Drug Enforcement Agency looking at um, ongoing uh, disposal protocol. So, you know, clearly, uh, and uh, Joe Renzisi, I'm sure, will probably talk about some of that. Um, but, you know, how do we make sure that there are kind of ongoing proper disposal of, of medications? Um, there, was, there was something, um, and I want to steal his thunder, I, I think of the drug we, you know, we don't know how many were uh, 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 opiate pain medications, but it was something like, in the number that, we, that have been hosted so far, there were something like 12 million tons of medication that were turned into disposal programs. It's huge. And again, you know, we don't know, you know, we don't know uh, of those which were uh, um, opioids, but, you know, uh, again, clearly, you know, we have a, a lot of people holding on to a lot of medications for uh, a very long time. Let's see. A couple more, and then we're, then we're good. Are we done? Two more? Let's see what we have. Uh, says comment upon a decrease in uh, RX abuse to young people. Um, with the concomitant rise in heroin use among the same group, um, it does give us pause, you know. And, and again, it does really give us pause to say, you know, are you know, is is the reduction in prescription drug abuse, you know, something good, um, or or is it an issue of that we're just seeing the balloon effect and and a simultaneous rise among the same people in in heroin use? And I think the data gives us pause. Um, to say that, and again, I think that's why looking at um, opportunities um, to make sure that we get people into treatment, that we have treatment readily accessible, so that you know we we do see you know so that so that we minimize uh, the risk of someone moving from prescription pain medication. So you know we hope you know we hope some of that is real, um, but again, some you know data that's coming out 
uh, uh, will you know give us pause here. And 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 again, this is why we have to look at kind of long-term prevention and um, uh, entrance to treatment as a way to do that. Um, I have a couple of patients where someone has anonymously called and told me the person was selling prescribed pills. Both patient told me I had a particular person that was engaging in a pattern of harassment against them. I checked HIPAA regulations and it appears that I am not allowed to report any of them to the police department. And again, this is probably not something that's in, in my lane uh, or my area of expertise and um, uh, you know, I'll refer that uh, question to other folks who have a uh, more fundamental understanding in terms of what are reporting requirements. Not trying to punt it, just not trying to give inaccurate information. So, well thank you everybody. I really appreciate the time and attention. Uh, thank you. Um, clearly, I think as our first speaker, you people have given you every question they've had for the last year about prescription drugs. Um, so, it, and it's pretty clear what's on everyone's mind. I, some of you may have seen that the February 20th issue of JAMA um, yesterday. I think it came was was online yesterday. Uh, something about 75 percent of deaths due to opioids um, were unintentional. 16 percent were intentional or suicide and the rest were unattributable. So um, <laughs> so that's hot off the press. Thank you very much for reminding us. Um, and so we're gonna take a 15 minute break now. I wanna thank you, Mr. Botticelli. That was a terrific presentation. Um, and hopefully the rest of the speakers in the next day and a half will answer all of our other questions. And oh, please. <laughs> um, back at 2.30.